Hi, I'm Yolanda and this is Speak On, the podcast that discusses culture, society and well-being. If there's one thing this year has made us even more aware of, it's our health and the importance of our health. Learning about health, fitness, nutrition has never been more accessible. It's everywhere. Social media and papers, people are talking about it on Facebook, people are more open discussing all that. Um, And it's hard to know where to look and who to follow. So I've invited nutritional scientists, functional medicine practitioner, food and health writer and consultant, Toral Shah. Actually, also, I should have added entrepreneur in there as well, because, you know, if there's something to do, she's just out here doing it. She's just out here accessing. And I loved, you know, I love it. I love to see it. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Yolanda. And I, I love how you introduced me as an entrepreneur. And you're right, <laughs> I am. I mean, entrepreneurship is in the family. So I'd be a letdown if I didn't do that too. I love that. love that. Family pressures just to be excellent. But, you know, you're out here doing it. Well, okay, so let's talk about this because you have, you know, you, you're a nutritional scientist, you're a functional medicine practitioner, all these things. How did you get into it and what was behind this career choice? So this was not my original career choice. As I think, and it's easier to say this in hindsight, when you're 16 or 17 and you're at school, it actually feels like there are very few career choices open, especially in, in, you know, I'm a bit older, I'm in my 40s. So, you know, it was either you become a doctor, become a lawyer, you go to banking, you know, it was one of those kind of things. And I actually went to medical school to become an oncologist because I knew from the age of 11 that I really wanted to work in cancer. You know, that's a whole other story. But um, I got to medical school and my mum had breast cancer um, a couple of years in and it made me realise that I didn't know if that's why I wanted a job, particularly as, as being an oncologist, because there's so much emotional kind of aspect to that job where you're dealing with people who are really, really ill, and yet you're having to be very kind of clinical about how you manage them. And I realised firsthand from my own experience with my mum that that's not what I want to do. I'm too empathetic. And for me, like separating myself from people is very, very hard. I also felt quite let down because... Um, they kept talking about getting rid of the cancer, but no one ever talked about prevention or prevention recurrence or the lifestyle changes. And for me, this is back in 1999, which ages me. Um, but And I, I knew there was evidence of studies coming out, but they weren't really talking about that to my mum. And I just thought, well, she's only 49. She's still got a long life ahead of her. Why are we not talking about this? And that's when I started doing the work, you know, the work and sort of start looking into research and you know, nutrition and things like that. Um, I was still at university, still at medical school, so I had access to a great library. This is pre <laughs> being on the internet. I had to like dive into the dusty kind of basement annals. That's where the uh, nutrition stuff was. But you know, I kept going and finding out stuff, and I suddenly thought, "Hang on a second, why are we not doing more? We're starting to really understand that nutrition and lifestyle can impact cancer, but also other diseases too." And yet, no one was talking about it. So I worked in research for a while um, in, in cancer oncogenes and realised that wasn't for me either. Had a brief spell in the city and realised that was not for me either and then came back and did a master's in nutritional medicine and that's when I really got that. We, and we had way more kind of information in just in those couple of years um, about the fact that nutrition you know, can make an impact. It was still really early days, it wasn't mainstream and by the time I did my master's 2004, I think that people still thought it was kind of odd it was a great course I did at University of Surrey and it really delved deep into kind of the science and the kind of medical part of it. But people are just like, mm, why is she doing this? And then eventually, you know, I've kind of tried to work with nutrition, but unfortunately no one was really interested. So I used to use food to kind of draw people in and kind of try and talk to them about nutrition. So I started my consultancy then called The Urban Kitchen and I tried to draw people in trick them with food and then try to talk to them healthily. I mean, that was essentially what I did. I mean, I didn't tell anyone that, but like I can talk about it now. And I, I say that to people because everyone's like, oh, are you cooking? I'm like, I've never really been cooking. And the reason I cooked was because, A, I love food and I'm passionate about it. But also, like, that was one way of bringing people into nutrition and trying to get them to understand about their lifestyle. So for me, that was kind of the anchor point. And also, you know, we're really, like, people were really interested in food then. There were all those food shows on TV and things like that. But yet, nutrition and lifestyle wasn't, you know, something that you either went to the gym or you didn't. That was kind of it, really. So um, it was just a really good experience to be able to bring all that together. And then slowly, as the years have gone on, people have become much more interested in nutrition. I can do it just as a, you know just as nutrition I don't yeah, have to like, yeah no more manipulating people through tasty dishes yeah the other thing that was also really important to me which I realized is that in our BAME communities and I'm using the way BAME just 
for the lack of using anything else better. Yeah. So that's black, Asian, ethnic minorities. Um, food such a big part of our cultural, our lifestyle, everything we do. Yet some of the foods we ate wasn't right for us, especially like given that we know that um, we're more likely to have type 2 diabetes and things like that. So that's when I really started getting involved with kind of projects with the BAME world. So one of the projects I did was uh, a diabetes project with a really good friend of mine who's a diabetes consultant at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. And we've been doing this for, what, 15, 16 years now, on and off. And it was basically, it started with South Asian people and looking at their diet because we, it was really sugar, carb, oil heavy. And we're like, how can we yeah. make it still tasty and nutrition and have that cultural and family aspect of it, the societal aspect of it, yet help people be a little bit more healthier to help manage their diabetes and then we've expanded into doing other kind of vein groups and it's something we had a big launch earlier in this year which we were going to redo but unfortunately we had to pause with covid and uh, my friend's mother died but you know again it's something that people are really interested in well, i'm sure we'll come back to it later in the meantime when i started my business and i just about was finishing my master's I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 29 and it was something I totally so young so young I didn't expect it well I didn't expect it certainly then because my mum's had it my aunt's had it loads of my mum's cousins have had it but you know not at that age and and obviously that's really impacted who I am as a person and how I deal with patients but also made me even more passionate about the work I was already doing with cancer patients and wanting to use nutrition so it's kind of come full circle. I I had breast cancer again for the second time, but kind of one and a half years ago. Yes. Um, but I'm still well, and I'm you know I'm re- mm-hmm. I feel very privileged because I'm with a really good hospital team at the Royal Marsden. But I also get to work on myself and all the latest research I'm now using on myself. So that's exciting. <laughs> Wow, my goodness, that is a journey. That's like so much that you've done in your career, and to have those kind of like huge life th- uh, like kind of what's the word I'm trying to think of I don't know I'm just overwhelmed because I wasn't I didn't realize this that you'd um had breast cancer twice and you'd beaten it twice wow and then to still be working in this it's just my goodness honestly I'm just completely overwhelmed um and at such a young age as well wow and how's this like impacted on your work going forward too like has it changed any of your missions um you know what what, what's it done you know and that's a question people ever ask everyone always assumes that i got into nutrition because i had breast cancer i was like no i was already on this path i was already doing this work and it, what it's made me do is become probably a bit more empathetic and also realize that what it might feel like and one thing it's quite hard to do is know if you haven't been through it yourself it's hard to know what it feels like even with my other patients diabetes patients and stuff i think having had been through something really big has given me a lot more compassion and empathy for people I work with but also yeah. like be able to explain it in a different way and be able to see things from a different light so one of the things I'm super passionate about again is raising awareness of cancer in our BAME communities because and we can always come back to this but there's so many stigmas and taboos and for me it was I think it's been quite shameful in all of our communities whether we're black Asian and like you know I talk to lots of people there's a religion aspect of it your people don't want to talk about so then they don't know about it and then they don't check themselves but also to be really honest I had an amazing role model in my mum because she mm-hmm. always talked about her breast cancer despite it being quite unusual she you know helped to run an Asian cancer support group she runs a breast cancer wow. support group still she's been doing this for like you know well 20 years so because she's so vocal and so positive and such a champion it's been a lot easier for me to talk about it. like it didn't occur to me not to talk about it mm. I think for me that's also because I realized quite early on that why were we not talking? why were we not being seen why were all the campaigns white ladies you know in their middle ages and stuff like that why were there people who didn't look like me and, and just kind of going into the health thing generally why are there not more people that look like me you know whether it's people of color maybe it's people who are just normal sized whether it's yeah. people, you know and not being cisgender you know all of those things you know straight da, 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 so yeah absolutely and I can and I completely relate about certainly about talking when it comes to things talking about healthcare within communities because you know we've we've had like discussions outside of this as well talking about how also people of color black people BAME community are treated within health as well and so many are ignored and because frankly you know when you've got every or the layers of everything else racism and all that kind of fun stuff to worry about sometimes health can really start to take a back seat and obviously there's gender there's racial trauma all these things you know they're impacting your mental health your physical health and then going to 
the doctors and then not necessarily being listened to and having to be really you know it's really hard to advocate for yourself to make sure that's the case on top of then seeing things in the health and wellness industry that just don't reflect you at all then you just aren't even thinking or talking about health it's just not even it's a thing that can happen to you not a thing you're necessarily taking care of there's so many layers as you've said so if we think about just the racial trauma we know that if we look at our health overall and our metabolic health but you know which can affect diabetes risk and heart disease risk stress of racism can increase our cortisol levels and that can impact you know the rest of our health you know so it there are all these things it can affect our health in ways that we probably haven't thought about the socioeconomic if you're thinking about where your next paycheck is coming from you're not going to be able to have the time and energy and space to worry about health if you're worrying that people aren't going to believe you then that's going to be a problem so for example i'm uber educated i've been to medical school i know a lot about cancer yet when i went to my gp despite the family history my mum and my aunt like maternal aunt having breast cancer she didn't believe me she did not believe me and she was said she was going to put me for a two-week referral and she didn't do that and for me this is back in 2006 not much has changed on average and i've got, you know, got the stats bane women have to go to the gp at least 2.1 times more to be diagnosed with cancer this is problematic yeah really problematic let alone the mental health issues. And, you know, I've been reading a lot more about this Embrace report and I love, love Candace Brathwaite's book, you know, I'm Not Your Baby Mother. But when you read those kind of um, books or, you know, people's experience of giving birth, mm-hmm. where they, you know, black women or, and people of colour are thought to have higher pain thresholds and not given pain because they, they have much higher incidence of um, postnatal depression and stuff but yet aren't treated because people don't believe or and we don't have that trust and that relationship and I'm not about myself personally and like yeah. Yeah, I've actually got a great relationship with my new GP um, I've got yeah. rid of the other one um, but you know I do see all of this so then there, it becomes compounded over and over again where people might feel something but they don't want to go because they're scared of being ridiculed or not being heard yeah. or not being listened to particularly women and then at the same time we have where the health in this, the health kind of NHS, there's systemic racism within the NHS, but massively in the whole kind of health and wellness industry, it's really about skinny white women. You yeah, know, that... absolutely. I can't tell you that the amount of events I went to, because yeah, being a freelance journo sometimes, the amount of events I've gone to that were health related and it's me I'm the black person so of course when they want to take pictures they're like oh come and come and take the picture I'm like no we're not doing this to make you look make your like your event look white cultural I am the only I am the only brown person here there is no one else here and it's always the same sizes the same people the same ages it's just yeah it's just ridiculous and I for example I did a campaign recently and I'm going to be very careful about the brands just because it's an ongoing conversation but I did a campaign for breast cancer recently and it was about younger women of breast cancer and they wanted to have a global campaign but yeah I was the darkest person you're looking at me I'm the light-skinned brown person I'm not even like a dark-skinned brown person (laughs) problematic so I had to sort of say something because Mm. you know and also everybody was very normal like slim I was the biggest person there again and like also like the whole cisgender thing too like it was all heteronormative but yet cancer doesn't discriminate that it happens to people who are non-binary it happens to people who are lesbians it happens to people of color it happens to people who are thinner it happens to people who are fatter why is that rhetoric there then that you know you can only be healthy um if you're slim and white and also the rhetoric in these campaigns to help raise awareness you're only still going falling into that very white definition of health yeah exactly only raising awareness to one community and then we'll then at the same time have a meeting saying how can we reach these other people and i'm like hmm let me think maybe adding someone else in a campaign it's not like it's hard this has been done before all you have to do is look up people that do it successfully and literally copy it i I, and i had to find someone for that campaign and i did find someone or you know a friend of mine's black but the point is that why didn't they think and even now they haven't even like acknowledged that i did that and i saved the campaign because the campaign was filmed well before black lives matters if that campaign had come out before just now without that person they would have been lambasted, like really, it would have yeah. been really problematic. And so I, 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 I said that the basic, I want you to thank me, I'll be, I want you to think about this. So, you know, now I'm going to have a conversation with them, but it's, and it's taken months to organise, absolutely months of me slogging my guts up, pushing and pushing and pushing. 
this is stuff I do for free. I don't need to, I'm doing this because I've got some level of privilege and some level of platform and power, to, but mm -hmm. it's taken so much energy from me, emotional energy. And yet yeah. there's a, like brands who say that they're global and they're inclusive and they're not, and they don't even get it. And also from a business perspective, I'm an entrepreneur. Let's just take the London market, Ray. 53% of people identify as BAME, so black, Asian, ethnic minorities. So if you're only selling to the 47%, you're kind of stupid because you're missing out on 50%, <laughs> like a whole other load of people you can sell shit to. So yeah. I'm like, you know, like one of the, I think, good examples for me is Oil of Ole. Because mm -hmm. um, they have had some great, um, you know, kind of TV adverts recently. And like, they're using different, okay, yes, they're using people who are celebrities, but they're using people who are not heteronormative cis skinny you know they're using people of different sizes different shapes people who are not with perfect skin people who are not models you know all of this stuff yeah. so i love that they use lily i love that you know the latest one i don't even know who the latest one was but like this this amazing fun curvaceous black woman and it, she just her her spirit just shone through and i'm like go you like i'm not going to use all of you but that's not the point the point is that the fact that i saw the advert i thought oh someone looks a bit like me oh maybe i maybe i should look into this you know yeah. so this is this is part of it like you can't then say and then people are saying oh no 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 you know and i'm like if you want to sell this i brought this up with a gym by the way by the way and they just absolutely ignore me so there's a gym that i used to work out at and um, they asked me to do a talk so i did and they've got really bad diet culture there and diet culture <laughs> I've done a whole IGTV episode on this, which you can find later. But, you know, really diet culture comes from uh, racism, slavery and, you know, colonialism. And that's a whole other conversation. But, you know, and I, I brought this up and I did this talk. But what I realised was I'm one of one of their older members. I'm definitely fatter. I don't look like all the gym bunnies. Yeah, they wanted me to talk. Fine, did it. But then I realised that they, I've got way more following. They did not share me on their grid. They said, oh, but we shared you in stories. I'm like, but why didn't you... You shared a junior nutritionist who had like a thousand followers on Instagram on your grid because yeah. she's skinny and blonde. You did show me. And they yeah. can't see the problem in it. Uh, yeah. And then this is, I suppose, this is the problem. This is where the whole, what is inclusion? What is diversity? At what level should these things sit at? It's about the decision-making level. It's about who's in the room it's about who's making the decisions and it's about acknowledging the audience and working up what your audience is as well there's so many different strands to it and i think that's kind of where it really is falling down in parts of wellness as well you know and it's like i mean even if you know if you type in yoga into google we all know what comes up <laughs> as well we know how that looks favorite one is professional hair so if you look up professional, it's changed in the last few weeks but if you yeah. looked at professional hair a month, a month ago, it basically was like white hair with like white straight hair, like white people with straight yeah. hair. Now there's obviously a few more black faces because I think someone brought it up and they've started to add that into the algorithm. But the problem is that, you know, all of these algorithms, they're all based on, um, a lot of them are based on white people, which is why like Facebook, Instagram, all of those things, they come from the same place. You know, it's... You know, it promotes white people. So unless you diversify your own feed and then you look at your Discover page, then you'll see more people. Like for me, even I realised the other day that, like, not now, but a few months ago, that when I go in the Discover page, it was quite white. But now, obviously, I'm trying to remove some of those people from my feed. Mm. But you have to go and do that yourself. And I hadn't yeah. done that knowing because I already follow loads of melanin, but it still just didn't show them. So I think it's... It, people don't even realise how led they are. And like our prejudice is learnt it's all learnt there's an amazing book called Sway by Dr um, Pragya Agarwal I think we talked about it and like you know it really describes where all this comes from because it's all learnt behaviour you don't get born with this stuff yeah exactly and then obviously this has this detrimental effect that we you know that we've discussed as well the disparities in healthcare, um like across like across races and how they're treated and obviously we know this has a huge huge impact uh when it comes to you know women in childbirth and you know black women dying was it something like how many it's like it's what it's five like times and more there we go yeah and i you know ethnic minorities and black people asian people they just have increased risk of poor health compared to white people and there's so much evidence to show this and it's all multi-dimensional social economic inequalities like racism the you know the way the medical system works and i think despite even having the evidence th this ethnicity it, it's been ignored in the, it's been a marginal thing in policy work and if you look at the whole covid report they had a, they just removed the whole section of ethnicity and race Brilliant. and like yet they're still going on about the fact that baying people are more likely to die from covid so yeah. right so you have a public health focus 
on a disease. You're saying that it's affected, but you're not investigating it. You're not even understanding, and you're blaming it on the people rather than looking at the socioeconomic thing. So, yeah. you know, there's no kind of the rhetoric is basically just looking at what they want to look at and not actually dealing with the issue. So, for example, like the new NHS Better Health, you know, um, advert that's going out at the moment. It's you know, again, it's putting the blame on us. But it's not actually looking at the underlying socioeconomic issues and the political issues and like the fact that their food isn't and that they're, they're blaming people what they're like blaming on us being unhealthy. But actually, like one of the things you brought up earlier was that racial trauma has a massive physiological impact on our health. Now, yeah. some people are faced with so much racial trauma every day, like even microaggressions. And I, you know, I'm really passionate about this. I'm going to do an IGTV on it, I've decided. But microaggressions, you know, every time you have a microaggression, and I'll explain this in a second, it increases your heart rate, it, your cortisol, your stress levels go. So it could be a small thing that you're a black man, you walk into a lift, and the woman that's in the lift already holds a handbag closer to her. That's a microaggression. And then there's, like, even today, I noticed that the police do stop black people more. So I've got a friend, Daryl, and he's, you know, really intelligent. He's called the Fitness Explorer on uh, Instagram. And he... um worked in banking for ages, so, you know, made a ton of money. And then, obviously, now he works in health and well-being. But he, you know, he has a lovely car. He did have a lovely car. And he kept, and he said he was stopped over 100 times. Because he's black, never because he drove badly. We can't let this keep going on. Yeah, definitely. This, and, it, you know, you made a really good point about the way that microaggressions and all these things kind of really affect you. Because... You know, I've, my mum's an activist. It's, I've been kind of working in, working with kind of so anti-racism and kind of being active in various things my entire life. But then over the past few months, one thing that I noticed was I was like, God, I was like saying to my friend, I was like, oh God, I've really, I've started like putting on weight around my middle, which I never do. And I spoke to my personal trainer, Lawrence from Salas. He's amazing. Um, but he actually, he really understands. He's, he's like, he's white, he's from Birmingham, but he's constantly talks about trauma and what trauma does to the body and intergenerational trauma and he talks about how that affects your cortisol levels and he was like yeah when you have increased cortisol you're going to put on weight around your middle and he said so even though you don't usually this is what's happened and I was like wow okay and I, I can almost kind of forgot and I realized of course I'm under in increased stress at the moment because it's in my face it's being talked about all the time and even like seeing it discussed on Facebook Whereas, you know, seeing things discussed on Facebook, it's fine, whatever, you can easily ignore it. But I think it's what it's, I've always kind of been affected by is the microaggression of people discussing it on Facebook that clearly don't give a shit. And they just want to be really, they just want to justify black people getting killed or really do the mental gymnastics that they're doing and con the, the contortionist levels they've got to, to justify racism is unbelievable that they're going out and they're finding fringe black voices to just prop up their racist rhetoric even though it's really easy just to accept yes this happens and whether if you're if you're committed to not giving a crap about it it can happen alongside you you can live your life and it will never impact you but to go out of your way to involve yourself in something that doesn't involve you and you don't care about it is the most some of the most racist bullshit i've ever seen and which i've happily gone and told people about and then taken them off and had to block them because i was like i'm sorry i can't keep internalizing your nonsense and you know this doesn't just work with pe white people so uh, mm. an example is when black like when george Floyd sadly died you know and i was started talking about racism which is how you and I met. Um, I mentioned there's a, a PR, a woman who runs a PR company and I follow her Instagram because I met her in real life. And she basically said something about, she went to space like, oh, I include blah, blah, blah. And she doesn't. Like her, none of her campaigns are inclusive. So I said something on Instagram. I said it really nicely. I said, all I said was, it'd be lovely if you could include more people of colour in your beauty campaigns. And then all her friends follow me, including black friends. And she basically got, and this woman even wrote an article on Medium about it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. just because you're black doesn't mean that you've not under that you've not been pushed down by colonialism and slavery, and that yeah. you've not got that you're being manipulated by the system, mm -hmm. and that you don't even get it. And so, and it was interesting how much you put of me, and like even thinking about it makes me feel stressed. It's stressing me, and I I put a little weight on my stomach too, and I'm like trying to be really good at it, and that's my job. I'm a nutritionist, but people forget that there's other things in play to your body composition and to your health, which are yeah. not just how much you eat, how much you exercise. There's psychological stuff, there's stress, there's your sleep. And obviously, if you're being constantly bombarded with racial tension, racial trauma, your sleep's going to be disturbed. You know, your cortisol levels are high, but also that lack of sleep 
is basically, especially because we've had so much screen time, all of us as well, you know, it's going to make, make you want to eat sugary, fatty things the next day. And that's going to change your kind of your hunger hormones and stuff like that. So people forget that there's so much more involved. And when this government's got basically trying to blame us all for being a bit unhealthy and fat, like they haven't actually looked at any of those things. No, yeah, they haven't taken any of those factors into account. So what kind of things could we do about this? How can we campaign about this? What kind of, what can we do to start getting the right messages to the right communities and the right people? So I think obviously there's so many different things to talk about. Like for me with mm-hmm. cancer, particularly, because I'm really passionate about cancer, just from a science perspective, but also from a you know p- practitioner and a person. But you know, for me, it's, I have, I'm having to go to the heads of all these cancer organizations, say, it's not enough. You need to make your programs inclusive. It's not enough just to have campaigns where you're fundraising and stuff with people of color. But you also, what's the point if then people come through a door, everything's very much about white people and the white diet. So, for example, when I think about nutrition diet, you know, everyone eats in a different way. Yeah. And not everybody has access to everything. And also some things, I remember there were some things growing up in my multicultural family. I'd, I'd go to an English friend's house and I'd be like, what is this? <laughs> so I don't know what this is. We've got all our own amazing vegetables and things too. You know, the African ones or the Asian ones, you know, whichever yeah. part of Asia, you're from South Asia, East Asia, wherever. And like, you know, all of those things. So why would you try and get them to eat kale and quinoa? And like, my whole point is we have to like absorb it. Also, we have to think about the cultural things about people talking about their different types of cancer and whatever you know the stigmas involved and you know especially with things like prostate and breast and you know your kind of sexual organs and stuff you know that, so that's the, the other thing then the other thing is we have to look at the systemic racism in the nhs i've got um, a couple of really good friends who work in this dr adrian milner being one and you know her research that was um released in the bmj earlier this year just showed that that you know white men are overrepresented you know, at the top of the NHS, and they're not as good necessarily. And like, so, and actually, the, the, the ethnicity that works most in the NHS is actually Chinese, but yet they're not as many consultants and things like that. So what's going yeah. on? You know, where, where is this? And also with, with childbirth, black babies and mothers do better when they're seeing black doctors and healthcare professionals. And so is that because there's a whole understanding? So why are we not realising that culture and understanding and compassion it's not equal. I mean, if you just think about men generally, men don't understand what it's like to be a woman. Some men are way better at it than others. When I think about some of the plastic surgeons I've seen because of my breast cancer, there will be men until recently. And I said to someone this year, I said, oh, because I've got to have some more reconstructed surgery. I said, I'd like to see a woman this time and preferably a woman of colour because actually I want them to understand like one of the things that is worse with people of color is that we're more like to have keloid scars yeah and like you know mine are really painful but no one's really asked me that and said anything so it's just there's so many different aspects i can't tell you like you know, about everything but yeah one of the things i love is nutritank which is a um organization which supports uh, medical students to have more nutrition and lifestyle education and they've been amazing like if you look at their content they're really trying to educate themselves and like get rid of this levels of prejudice and get, get really educate themselves on what it's like to be from a different ethnicity as a mm-hmm. trainee doctor so i think that's wonderful let's have campaigns that are truly inclusive let's actually make gyms and other places inclusive like i complained to a gym recently and I'm, in fact i'm going to mention them i'm going to out them frame that, you know, I, I felt old and too big to be in there and too brown and they just didn't really want to listen. And then they were like, try to get HR involved. I'm like, well, I'm just giving you some feedback. And also, yeah. I'm the one that exercises a lot and I don't really mind going anywhere. I'm really happy and yet I'm still feeling reluctant to come into your rooms and you're not getting it. And like, they've got some new diversity kind of round table, but yet they... They weren't paying people to do that work. Pay people to do the work. Pay us. Yeah, I, I had this when I was doing that um, How to Be Anti-Racist. I had so many phone calls and things beforehand with different organisations. And they were like, well, we just want to find out more. And then we'll like, we'll attend some, watch some so then we can like get you, like we'll hire you, whatever else. I knew that I knew some, some of them have. Some of them I completely knew that it was just bullshit. Um, but then they basically were just like, oh yeah, let's see what we can get out of you because we're not going to pay you. We're just going to go and recreate this from our perspective. Understand we can, take some notes then just throw this around and hope for the best and it's like well that's fine because i was like continue to do that because then when you when you when you fuck up black twitter are going to come for you no and that's so. exactly it so all my <laughs> yeah. organizations i've put them in touch with an amazing like anti-diversity like organizational uh consultant who basically is a management consultant has got a phd in this in like you know um not just racism but also kind of like the whole gender aspect too and she's black and she's brilliant and mm-hmm. i'm like you know do you really do that deep work it's not a surface level thing 
Mm. It's not just let's just get a few more people. I'm like, I think what's been interesting is that organisations have got more people of colour working there. It's actually better. So World yeah. Cancer Research Fund, actually, when I go into their offices, there's people of all different colours. I used to work there. It is. It's, it's, it's really, yeah, yeah. It's hella multicultural in there, yeah. It is multicultural. And yeah, there's definitely mm. work to do for the campaigns. And yeah. Stuff. yeah. Yeah, some of the yeah, some of the campaigns they, they they did need tweaking, but the good thing is they listen. Yeah, and so you know, some of the we talked about this well before Black Lives Matter from last year that we need to some of the food stuff is a bit you know whitewash and we need to change it because yeah da da and that's great. But yet other charities like it's just like there's not a single non-white person working there. And then you think, well, that's going to be the underlying kind of bed that you're growing things in. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's what I suppose, like you were saying, I think that's the thing that needs to be addressed. It's about where the decisions are made, where the campaigns are are built. Just almost like people learning to think outside of themselves a little bit more as well. And I know they did. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. How I'm going to get so many aspects of this incorrect now. But they did um, uh, kind of a, an exercise or a project uh, with young writers in the US. Um, and they got a bunch of comedy writers to write sitcoms. Um, like test sitcoms, test formats. And when they got them back, and it was like mixed, you know, it's like kind of a nice mixed panel. All the ones that were pretty much all the ones that written by white people just were about white people. And they very specifically were very, like, were like, these people, this is, this person's white. They described this person, blah, blah. They had really specific things. If they had any people of colour in, it was very much around stereotypes. The ones they got back from the people from other backgrounds either just didn't mention race, so it could have been colourblind casting, or when they did, nothing was, it was just like, that person is that race, and some of their experience may come into it, but on the whole, it was just like, and this is them, this is just the story. And, you know, you're when you're brought up in that world where everything around you is, you can just think outside of yourself just in a slightly different way. And, you know, we, I've been with one of my friends that's in my bubble. We've been doing a 90s movie long <laughs> marathon. And what we noticed in the 90s, before social media and all this stuff, actually movies just generally were much more multiracial. Just the normal everyday people walking past and the cast. And now yeah. there's so much white. And I think one thing that I will say is that, you know, this whole influencer thing, like, you know, it's it, it, there's a whole kind of group of people who it is easier for white people to get more following and stuff like that and like even to get the blue tick so somebody i've been trying for ages and like you know i've got loads of knowledge and yet somebody who's got a lot less knowledge has just had breast cancer was given the blue tick at a much lower level and white people are more likely to do it and just stuff and then who do people trust these celebrities and influencers over people who actually know stuff and then they trust the white people over the other people like i did this talk and about you know racism on IGTV and like it's had thousands, hundreds of like tens of thousands of views and somebody challenged me on the statistics. Someone whose poor partner worked at a pharmaceutical company and I'm like, and then I shared the statistic. They they didn't believe me and that was yeah. also like, yeah, why would I do that? Like and it was amazing that they just didn't get it and it was like yeah actually a little bit heartbreaking and soul destroying. But at the same time, I was like, I have to do this and there was a beautiful um meme I shared about privilege on Instagram the other, I said maybe last night I can't remember it was about you know sometimes like you know when you have privilege we have to talk about these things whatever your privilege might be whether it's a platform or whether it's yeah you know being white or whatever it is and for me I just um like I suddenly realized how much of it's, it takes a lot of courage but that courage could be a savioristic kind of wanting to rescue people but when we have to think about coming from love and coming from like do you, if you had children, would you want a world like this to be that for your children? Do you want it to be like this for everybody? No. And I think that I have to keep reminding myself and also putting boundaries in because otherwise it's so exhausting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Kalechi talks a lot about her boundaries. Um, I don't know if you follow her, Kalechi Okof or Kalechi Nikoff. Um, she is on Twitter and on Instagram. And she just, she's so clear with her boundaries. And she's like, yeah, if you, this is what you're going to get when you come here. And if you do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to block you. Just go away. And it's brilliant. Because also, mm. like, when you meet her in real life, like, I used to go to her dance classes ages ago, well before, you know, yeah. this whole thing became big. And, like, I think she she's like that, but she's just also incredibly loving and kind. Yeah, she's so kind, isn't she? And it's, and it's just, just really clear. And I love that. She's just very, very clear. And that's what I enjoy. But Brini Brown says something about boundaries. Like, if you're really clear with your boundaries, then people know how to love you and treat you. And, like, you know... Mm they know how to behave around you. And like, for me, it's been a massive learning this year about clarifying my boundaries. And you know, people don't like it. Yeah, but I suppose also though, that starts, things, it cycles right back around into your health by setting the boundaries, then you are also maintaining a certain level of your health or trying to contribute, contribute to maintaining that. And I think that's definitely things to be 
learnt and talked about and that's why I really like your channel and I think it's really good as well that we start talking about those things even more and increase these conversations amongst ourselves and with different companies so they can start to understand these things too because obviously so much of it is just general lack of understanding I think people can get incredibly defensive and it's like look we're not coming for you for stuff you don't know but we're going to come for you if you keep doing stuff that's stupid yeah and like if people have said something giving you feedback if you haven't taken that on then that's problematic so i think also if you're just ignoring it because like Mm. i've done the good right thing i'm it's not about calling people out it's about calling people in and saying listen this is how we need to work with you this is how we do and like i've been just as guilty of the call out culture yeah and i don't do that anymore but like you know with some of these brands and these companies i've really gone to the head and i've talked to them behind but in real life, you know, not on the screen, not on social media, because I don't think that's fair necessarily. But sometimes you have to do cool. Like people say, like yeah. there's a brand, I remember a fitness brand, that they keep saying they're going to do something. And they're a really big brand and I've done work with them before and they're not actually, they've not actually shown anything yet. So for yeah. me, like, I'm like, well, if you don't do something the next month or two, then I will do something in publicly because actually yeah. you're not listening, you know, so. Yeah, and that's a shame. I think so many people have, We've noticed that, they, but a lot of people are playing lip service and stuff now. And I think, you know, I mean, with the whole kind of call out culture, it's like I'll call out things if it's like, well, if I if I see you're doing stuff and you're just doing it on purpose and you're just doing it regardless of what feedback you've got. Like there are a few times you go on my Twitter, you can even see there's a few times I've blatantly just mentioned brands or people and things that have have a sustained history of doing things regardless of the impact not caring about anyone and i know like internally are just quite overtly abusive and racist and upholding these systems for their own benefit etc then you deserve it but i like what you were saying it's the call in culture there are times when there have been companies and i've just messaged and said you know what this is a bit wild do you want to talk about it hun it's the balance, right? Like, if you think about Bon Appetit, the American food magazine, it had to be called out because it was just for years and years, they were literally not even play, paying black and brown people. There was all yeah. misogynistic white people at the top and it became toxic, so toxic. The culture, they weren't paying video people, they weren't paying, you know, people writing recipes. They were literally, like, it was just become so disgusting that people had to call them out and actually, you know, the whole team's been changed and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, it's owned by, owned by Condé Nast. They need to do the work for all the other brands and magazines because it's, if it's in one place, it's going to be in other places. Oh, yeah, yeah. These things don't exist in microcosm, do they? They If it's, it's part of the culture, it's part of the culture. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I've loved this chat. I feel like we could do it for it's forever, forever, right? I know. We're like, we're going to need to give us a wine next time. Exactly, definitely. So where would you like to be found on social? And what kind of, I'd say, actually, have you got a parting message as well? for for like what you would like to see in the wellness industry within our community and outside of our community so i would say for both community for all communities we can only be what we can see so that means we need to be if we're doing a passing on a public health message in the public health message we have to include people of different sizes shapes colors genders sexualities religions because disease does not discriminate yes there's socioeconomic aspects to it and that's a bigger problem but let's at least start sharing public health you know messaging which is inclusive and actually acknowledges that people are different yep amazing and where can we find you online so i'm on instagram at the urban kitchen uh, i'm on twitter but not so much on urban kitchen and uh i have my own website www.theurbankitchen.co.uk and i'm and i have another brand called what the health where my business partner and i um amy abrahams is a health journalist we look at health from the world health organization perspective of what sustainable kind of physical mental emotional health but our whole thing is about inclusion and diversity so our panels are always very mixed are you know the people attending is mixed we really really want it to be for everybody and it is different from other health events um so we will be doing a talk we're doing you know quite a lot of instagram and other kind of well everything's online at the moment but i'm if you yeah. look at my instagram i'm always sharing i do a lot of work at integrative camps over the next few months I'm, I'm doing a lot of events so if you every week there'll be a talk or an event or an igtv so come and find me so i will talk about just food i will talk about nutrition i talk about disease prevention and health optimization i talk about cancer diabetes i talk about sustainability and you know and just health of the world so amazing thank you so much for joining me today i've loved this and i can't wait for wine next week yeah thank you so much it's been so great thank 
you for listening to Speak On. Make sure you like, subscribe and share with your friends, family, co-workers, strangers in the street. To find out more about us, including our upcoming events, head over to Instagram, instagram.com forward slash speakon underscore. Bye.